After one entire month of using the CEO display as my home monitor every single day, I have both some major positives and some major negatives that I want to address, some that I haven't seen any other reviewers mention before. And I want to start off with my five main positives, with the biggest one being the sharpness. The CEO display is one of the only four Retina monitors out there. We have the LG Ultrafine 5K, 4K and the Pro Display XDR. And that's it. The text is razor sharp and the overall image clarity is shockingly impressive. And this is thanks to three things. Number one, the insanely high PPI of 218 pixels per inch that no other PC monitor even comes close to. Number two, the lack of a anti-reflective coating which all the other monitors have, aside from the retina ones, which gives them this fuzzy look, especially on white backgrounds. And number three is that perfect 2 to 1 retina scaling which gives us a workable resolution of 2560 by 1440, which is plenty enough for all of your workspaces. If you're thinking of the main reason to even get this monitor, the sharpness is that. The second thing that I absolutely loved was its brightness. So I measured mine at 560 nits, so a bit lower than Apple's advertised 600, but significantly higher than my Dell's, which was just about 360. At my home office, I often have direct sunlight that makes my Dell basically unusable. Uh, which means that I always have to pull down the blinds when it is sunny. My studio display was perfectly usable thanks to the high brightness level and I also didn't feel the need for that nano texture version at all. It was that good. Of course, that having a 1600 nit panel like the Protospec DR or the new MacBooks would have been great for watching HDR content, but uh, during the one movie that I actually watched on this, I didn't actually feel the need for any additional brightness and I don't really work with HDR content anyways. And watching actual HDR content on YouTube wasn't that bad either, as having close to 600 nits of brightness actually made it more HDR than all the other monitors who claim to have HDR but they can only go to like 300 nits of brightness or so. The third thing that I really loved were the speakers. More specifically, the volume and the clarity that I got out of them. I didn't really have any computer speakers at home, so going from my MacBook speakers to this was a massive upgrade. However, I did feel like the bass was overly strong. In a lot of cases, it even caused the content to be distorted. I mostly noticed this when watching movie trailers. <laughs> I wish there was a way to adjust the equalizer and maybe improve this. Um, I do hope that Apple gives us a software update to hopefully improve the bass. If not, uh, you can check out apps such as Boom 2, which does allow you to adjust the equalizer. The fourth thing that I really loved was the connectivity. I was able to connect my external Samsung T7 SSD as well as my Time Machine backup drive directly into the display without losing much performance. I was unable to do this before and had to use one of these Thunderbolt docks. It is a shame that we don't have an HDMI port as you can't really connect this to a console or a PC, unless your PC of course has Thunderbolt. Speaking of that, I did try it on Windows and while I was able to use it, center stage did not work. The fifth thing that I absolutely loved was how amazing this monitor looked on my desk and how well it is built. It is by far the most premium monitor that you can buy with a full aluminum body and a full glass covered front. The attention to detail is simply incredible with the vent cutouts on the top matching the ones on the Mac Studio. I do wish that the bezels were a bit thinner. My Dell has significantly thinner bezels, which does make it look more modern. And I think that a whole reason why uh, it is thicker than the M1 iMac is because of the internal power supply, which on the iMac, this is external. Maybe Apple was envisioning a scenario where you have a couple of Apple Studio displays, and then having a large power supply for each of them would be far more inconvenient than just having a thicker display. But still, design-wise, this thing is a joy to look at. And just a few bonus things that I really liked. For example, when you rotate the screen, the UI will automatically rotate, which is quite cool. It also has a light sensor for adjusting its brightness automatically, which the LG Ultrafine 5K does not have. And it is also the quickest monitor to wake up from sleep that I've ever used. In terms of my negatives, the most shocking one to me was the color accuracy as I assumed that Apple's studio display would be the benchmark in color accuracy, but I was wrong. To measure the color accuracy, you need a professional tool such as our X-Rite 
I want Display Pro Plus colorimeter. Any number under 5 is okay, but any number under 2 means that your display's color accuracy is excellent. My studio display got 1.5, which means that it is excellent. But what really shocked me was that my Dell U2720Q got 0.7. Now, this was after calibration on both, but still. So my current $600 monitor is more accurate than my $1,600 Apple Studio display. Something else that I was shocked about was the color gamut, which is uh, the range of colors that a monitor can display. The three main color gamuts are sRGB, P3, and Adobe RGB, with Adobe RGB being the standard for photographers. Apple doesn't really state the percentage of coverage on their website, so for years, I was under the impression that this meant 100% sRGB, 100% P3, and a very high Adobe RGB of over 90%. Based on my measurements, we do indeed have 100% sRGB, but only 98% DCI P3, and just 85% Adobe RGB. This is considerably better than my Dell, which got about 83% DCI P3 and 82% Adobe RGB, but compared to other monitors like the Dell UP2720Q, which is the photography version of my own monitor, that one has a 100% Adobe RGB coverage, or if you take a look at the BenQ SW271C, that one offers a 99% Adobe RGB coverage, so yeah, the studio display is quite underwhelming here. Not only that, but Apple claims that it can show 1 billion colors which is only half true, as this is actually an 8-bit panel with Dithering, meaning that it can only display 16.77 million colors, but actually tricks the human eye by using clever uh, frame rate controls to give you the impression that it is showing more colors. Most monitors do this, to be honest, but if you were expecting this to be a true 10-bit panel, it isn't that. My third negative is the ergonomics. Now, this wasn't as bad as I initially expected, but the fact that I couldn't adjust the height uh, of my monitor meant that I had to adjust the height of my chair in order to be in line with the top of the screen. Of course, that I could have just paid $400 extra uh, to get the raisable stand option, but I already think that this monitor is far too expensive for what it is. What is even crazier is that all competitor monitors, from the cheapest $200 ones to the crazy $1,500 ones, they all come with a height and rotation adjustable stand in the box. Apple doesn't even allow you to adjust the rotation on that extra $400 one, which is crazy. And even if you do get that $400 one, you cannot swap it out for a vase amount further down the line. You're stuck with the one you buy, unless you take it to the Apple store and you pay a labor fee to get it replaced, which is ridiculous. So I think that what most of you should do if you plan on getting this monitor is to buy the VESA model and then simply buy uh, one of these VESA arms or uh, even just a VESA stand and that would allow you to raise it and rotate it. Uh, if you want to find a good one, then I've left a link in the description. My fourth negative is how through my entire month of using this monitor, I could not find a single use for that Apple A13 chip that's inside. Yes, in case you don't know, Apple not only added an iPhone 11 chip to handle the audio and image processing from the camera, microphones, and speakers, but they also gave it 64 gigabytes of storage. Now, that's because there was no 32 gigabyte model of the iPhone 11, so it is likely that the Apple A13 chip was already designed to work with those specific 64 gigabyte modules, reason why Apple had to include 64 gigabytes inside of this. Not only that, but this whole monitor actually runs on iOS 15.3, which is insane, although, completely useless. Like, I still don't get why Apple included this, as even on the LG Ultrafine 5K that uh, doesn't have an A13 but still has speakers, microphones, and a webcam, uh, all of that is being processed by the Mac that it's connected to and not a dedicated chip. Like, in a way, I do know ex why they've done this. Uh, it's for compatibility with older Intel Macs to give them center stage and Hey Cindy support, but personally, I just don't think that those features are that important to uh, justify the increase in cost that much. I mean, Apple should have at least given us something, some actual use case with that Apple A13. At least, I don't know, give us access to those 64 gigabytes of storage, even that would be something. Because right now, that A13 is only there to drive up the cost. And my final complaint is in terms of the webcam and center stage. So since our initial video comparing it against the LG Ultrafine 5K that you can watch right here, you know, I've actually used the webcam for a couple of video calls. And I found out that the main reason why center stage and the quality of the main camera was so bad was not necessarily because of the ultra wide module and the crop in, uh, but just because it wasn't tracking me that properly. So you can probably tell that I'm not in the frame right now fully, uh, and it's not really tracking me even if I move my head. Um, 
yeah, Apple needs to update this. Another reason why having that A13 is just useless as it's not even doing its own job center stage right at the moment. Now, Apple promised us a firmware update to improve the quality of the webcam, and I can confirm that we did actually get an update. However, I didn't really see any major improvements to the quality. And this is likely because there isn't much that Apple can do, it's just the nature of how this camera was designed. Since we have a 12 megapixel ultrawide module, which then crops into a one megapixel image for that center stage zoom, it makes all of that noise in the image way more obvious. I do think that Apple should have just stuck with a normal lens, like on the M1 iMac. Like how often do you really think that you would bring your family into a video call? probably not that often to justify the major trade-off in image quality. So having said all of my positives and negatives, who is this display for? Is it for gamers? Absolutely not. And I'm not saying that because of that fixed 60 Hertz refresh rate, um, but the thing is having 5K as a resolution makes it so much more demanding on your system. In Hearthstone, for example, I was getting 120 frames per second on the MacBook Pro's 3K display compared to 40 frames per second on the 5K studio display. Is it for photographers? Well, if you work in P3, then yes. If you need Adobe RGB, then there are far better options out there. Is it good for video editors? Well, kind of. If you don't work with HDR content, then this is a great choice as since it is 5K, you have the ability to view a full native 4K window with enough room for your timeline uh, and that extra brightness does come in handy. But I think that the best use case for this monitor is for general productivity. It is an outstanding display for office work and working with documents and Excel sheets thanks to its sharpness and true tone that makes it so easy on the eyes. And the fact that you can indeed do anything on this from photo editing to emailing to 3D modeling and everything would look razor sharp that's what makes it so special. However, my main concern is the lack of future proofing. You're buying a $1,600 display that only has a 60 Hertz refresh rate and still is an LCD panel, where you could literally buy a 4K OLED TV, 120 Hertz, which is also 10 bit and it's cheaper than this. And that's ridiculous. And if you plan on keeping this for the next six or so years, like I did with my LG Ultrafine 5K, it will be even more outdated at that point. Of course, that a 5K 120Hz refresh rate display is quite difficult to do today, as DisplayPort 2.0 is required for that, which Thunderbolt 4 does not support unless manufacturers specifically add it. But Mini-LED would have easily been possible, especially at this price point, if Apple really wanted to. I didn't really mind that it's an LCD, uh, even watching content at night was fairly decent, but I would have still preferred a mini LED panel. It looks like this is now reserved for a Studio Display Pro that would retail for even more. There are plenty of great other monitors out there, including Huawei's Mate View Display, which I'm really curious to try out, as it looks almost as good as the Studio Display. Of course, that is not a Retina Display, so if you do want a Retina Display, uh, then you have to go for the Studio Display or the LG Ultrafines. If you do want to see how the Studio Display stacks up against the LG Ultrafine 5K, check out our previous video right here. I'm Daniel, this is Zenoftech, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Zenoftech, signing out. Cheers.